Good morning, everyone. So uh, today you get a brief break from your regular scheduled programming. Don't worry, bear with me one week. Mike will be back next week. So you only got to deal with it for one morning. So um, it's sports season, right? I was looking at the, the lineup, and there's hockey games, baseball games, basketball games, football games. There's one like the 49ers they could play in at 10 o'clock this morning. Thank you all for being here. I know some people are tempted to not. But all the sports fans out there, if you have a team that you're playing, that you have that you favor, and they're playing a game, here's a question for you. Are you cheering on, shouting, hoping for a great big loss? Nobody? OK. All right, well, you know, we don't hope they fumble the ball or, you know, it's not the right way, right? No one cheers on the team and hope to lose. We all want to win. Winning feels good, doesn't it? it? Makes us feel proud. Feel better when we win. And that's what I want to talk about today. Look a little bit deeper in that topic, as I think it's there's some good lessons there, something that we can learn for our life. So there's a lot we can look into with this topic. A lot that's been written about this topic. But let's look at a few things, and let's start with looking at a win that many of us are familiar with, and hopefully that we can learn something from. Today, it's going to be the one slide you see all day, so hopefully it's nice and pretty. For everybody who's got a Bible with them, go ahead and open it up. Or if you don't have one, look in front of you, because that's what we're going to be using from. So, and you only need it just for a little bit. But in a moment, we'll turn to a, a chapter. But we'll turn to a win that was huge. There's a victory in the Bible that was monumental. And at one point in time, there was this kingdom. And it was on the rise to become a great empire. And at this time, they were a large nation. They weren't an empire yet. They were just growing. And it had, and this capital city was big. And this is an ancient town. That city took you three days to walk across. Had more than 120,000 people in it. It was a big place. And on the path to become an empire, what do you see with so many empires? They were brutal. They had a rough reputation. So much so that the person that was sent to them turned tail and ran the other way. However, once this person, they got a little, their head on a little bit more straight, they went in the middle of town and this is what happened. If you would, turn to Jonah, the book of Jonah. Now, we're going to look in Jonah 3. 4 through 10 for right now. But just start with just verse, verse 4. Jonah 3, verse 4. And I'll give you a moment to find it. Jonah 3, verse 4. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown. Imagine walking to downtown San Jose and yelling that out. How would you feel? To tell the town that's basically going to this empire that's taking over people, hey, 40 days, y'all are all gone. Think he's got a warm reception? So imagine walking up to a group of NFL linebackers and telling them that they're going to get destroyed. And this is Jonah walking into a town with an army of linebackers telling them they're going to be destroyed. But let's see what happens. Let's go down to verse 5 and read on. Jonah 3, verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed the fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused to be reclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Verse 10. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Now, Think of this. 
Jonah had one of the most simplest but effective messages ever. He goes into town, tells them going to be destroyed. Boom! They are turning back and on the right path for a little bit, right? Now think about it. If you're a sports team, how big of a win is it to have 120,000, more than 120,000 souls turn around and start heading the right way? Can you imagine if today, if we touch 120,000 souls and get them on the right track? I'm hoping you just don't fall asleep today. This guy turned the whole town around. That's a huge win, right? He should have been doing the best touchdown dance ever out there. He should have been celebrating. Now, he must have felt so, so very good, right? But, let's see what he did. This is what a win that should have set Jonah on cloud nine for a really long time. He should have been basking that glory for a while. However, let's turn to chapter 4 and see what actually, he actually did. Jonah 4, 1 through 4. Jonah 4, starting in verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, uh, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, where I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O oh, oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said to him, Is it right for you to be angry? Think about this. This guy just had the biggest victory you can imagine. 120,000 souls. And he's asking for his death. What happened? Why? How does that work? And what in the world was he thinking? Well, he tells us a little bit. So let's kind of look at what he says. We just read it. So let's take a closer look. In verse 2. Uh, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? I think about this. This is a prophet of God. Trying to correct God. Going, hey, did, did I not tell you, God? But, here's a catch this. Turn back a few pages. Go to chapter 1. And let's see what he actually said. Jonah 1. 1 to 3. Jonah 1, verse, beginning of verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid a fare, went down into it, and he was going with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Turns out Jonah didn't say anything. He just turned tail and ran. So he got this news, go tell, talk to Nineveh, and he's out the door, right? What else did he say? So turn back to chapter 4. Let's go back to chapter 4, verse 2, and see what else he's talking about. Let's try to figure out what's happening here. In verse 2, Jonah continues, For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Now right there, right at that moment, he's got another touchdown. He's got another victory. He hits the head, on the, head of the nail right there. He gets it. God was merciful. Instead of moping that town, Nineveh wasn't wiped out completely. He should have realized what he himself was saying and why God let him be. Now, for a brief side note, you might remember the history of Assyria and what Assyria becomes. Us, in, in retrospect, can see things. Assyria actually becomes a big empire that takes out Israel. But that's for like a generation or two down the road. Right now, they're just a growing country. So, if he knew that, that would be one thing to say, hey, we just like to see go. But he didn't know that. Nowhere in the world was it recorded that he knew that. Only God knew that. So that couldn't have been why he was upset. The encounter with Jonah was pivotal in history. It was pivotal for Assyria. They went from being nearly extinguished to set on the path to become a great empire. Jonah didn't know it, but he played a pivotal role in world history. 
still another reason why he should have been proud of the consciousness that he had achieved. But we just read earlier, Jonah, short after Jonah touches on that key understanding situation, Jonah turns and asks for God to kill him. So how did Jonah take this phenomenal victory and turn it into a loss? What was it? As we're reading, this is perspective on this, right? It's his attitude. The way he views what happened. Instead of viewing it as, this is major, this is a big difference, this is phenomenal. He's thinking, I gave them a message and they're not being destroyed. There's no fire coming down. What's going on here? He's moping that the town didn't get wiped off the map. Instead, they got saved and still on the right track for a little bit. Now, let's hold on to this right now. Perspective and attitude. And I want to focus on that for a moment. Here's a question for you. If you don't have a million dollars, is a million dollars a lot of money? Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. If you've got many billions of dollars, is a million dollars a lot of money? No, nah, not really. It's a fraction. Has the amount of money changed? That same million dollars. Looking at two different ways is a very different perspective. So, if a player is hungry, they're never satisfied, and they want to keep working, striving, building, preparing, we call that player a champion, right? If a stockbroker is hungry, never satisfied, and they keep working, striving, building, preparing, what do we generally call that person? We call them greedy. <laughs> right? But why do we look at one positive and one negative? Could the stockbroker be a generally nice person? They could, right? It could be the, the sport player is a, a complete jerk. We don't know. But we have opinions about that. And again, it comes back to our attitude and perspective. A lot of folks have played sports. A lot of people have, even informally, only some people have played the stock market. It's different. Sports generally has rules, referees. Sure things are fair, the rules have been broken. Stocks, you've got security exchange commission. There's often an assumption that the stock broker's done something to get what they did. It's a matter of our attitude perspective, how we judge and perceive persons, right? Many persons play sports. Some people play stocks. We all got an opinion about the two. People in general have attitudes and perspectives based on their past and experience. Those attitudes and perspectives, they change how we look at the world, doesn't it? Now, that view of the world, that's what I want to get to. So keep that in mind. Jonah, a prophet of God, was scared enough to try to run out of town, make a ludicrous attempt at running away from God, even tossed overboard, swallowed by fish. <clears throat> He'd been camping out in there for three days and three nights. He got vomited out of the fish on the land, had to trek across land over to Nineveh, and then walk into town and proclaim they're going to be destroyed. A lot had happened to Jonah, right? And most of it was because of his insane attempt to try to run from God. Jonah's attitude and perspective, his view of the world, kept him from seeing the history changing right in front of him. Now, do we be guilty of that same thing? Do we end up finding ourselves overlooking things? We can have tremendous victories right in front of us and take them for granted, can't we? Now, see some inquisitive looks. How about an example? How many of us in here have loved ones? Spouses, family, friends, children. I see lots of them, right? I see some laughs. You know where I'm going, don't you? <laughs> That's a tremendous, to have someone love you is a tremendous victory in life, isn't it? To have a sibling that you grew up with, be able to talk about, have a spouse you can rely upon, that's huge. But a lot of time we don't think about it. My kids, they're sitting in the back of a car and they're crowded and they're like, I need some room. And they're actually getting some time to bond and build together, but instead they're thinking, hey, I, I got to put on my headphones and get away from you folks. They don't realize what's going on to them. Yes, kids, I know you're online, so thinking about you. The victories of having loved ones in our lives, we overlook them. And that's due to our attitude and perspective. It's common, it's every day, it's just there. But let's take this a little bit deeper. That's a simple example, right? How do we choose? the victories, the fights, 
the things that we work for, the things that we want to win. How we need to ask ourselves, what are we winning? Now we crave validation. We crave accomplishment. So we crave winning, don't we? Everybody's got that. We want to win. I can't. Does anybody here want to lose? Not a single hand. How many of you want to win? Every single hand in the house, right? It's human nature. What are we winning? Why don't we choose what we want, what we choose to win? Now for Jonah, the message that he delivered won the souls of over 120,000. They got turned in the right direction for at least a generation, or for, for a while. However, Jonah seemed really want to see that message carried out. He wanted to see it come to pass. He wanted to see what he spoke come through. Now that meant the death of over 120,000 people. All the livestock, everybody there. But he wanted to see the fireworks. He wanted to see it happen. Now, when we play a game, we win. It does feel good. We pat ourselves on the back, done, we've done a good job. It was our skill, our training. Us, right? We did that. Now bear with me here for a moment. Skill, training, the person, they all come into effect. They all come into play and they're necessary. But if we get to the point of understanding how we choose our wins, we gotta dig deeper. Whose message was it that Jonah was delivering? Go back to Jonah 3, 5. I heard somebody say this, God's, right? Yes. Jonah 3, verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. It wasn't they believed Jonah. Jonah's some crazy guy walking through town shouting. They believed God. Now, God was the one who had the power to cast judgment. He was the one that had the power to grant mercy. Jonah delivered the message. But it was really God's party. It was really God's victory. We play this game of life. It's God who gave us our talents, gave us our help, our skills, the opportunity to even play the games, and even our life itself. If we're playing this game of life for ourselves, no matter how many times we think we've won, we've actually lost, haven't we? It doesn't work that way. We need to make sure that we realize that we're living our lives for God. We belong to God. And everything we do should be about that. God gave us the free will. The only thing we've got control over is our free will. But he gave us that free will, and we get to choose freely what we want to do with our lives. However, if we get the least bit of perspective on what God's perspective is and his attitude, then we can really see things as they really are. Now think about this. Anybody ever borrowed somebody else's car? Probably somebody in time, right? Well, those that can drive, borrow somebody else's car. So when you get that car, do you have control over it? Can you keep on driving it? Can you drive it off a cliff? Do whatever you want to with it. Just keep on trucking, right? As long as you can get the gas in it. Where should that car eventually end up, though? At home, right? Back with the owner. Now, it's that same thing with our lives. We're driving this vehicle. But it's not really ours, is it? It's given to us by somebody else. The only sane and rational choice when we realize what the reality is is to basically take ourselves back home, take ourselves back to God, right? Once we realize where we came from, who sustains us, we only right to give it back to God. Let's take this discussion back to Winnie, and we'll close things out. It's a short message today. Here's another question for you. How many people out there have ever arm wrestled a baby? No hands? I'm hoping that's, that's good. That's good. I'm glad. It's kind of a crazy thing to see an arm But here, imagine this in your head. Imagine you got like oh, a big bodybuilder, a wrestler, fresh wrestler, and they got a little baby, and they're about to wrestle now. You get that in your heads? Think of that. Keep that in your heads for a moment. It seems crazy. Bear with me. How satisfying is that win to that bodybuilder? It's not, is it, right? Boom, done. Boom, done. Boom, done. 
Little baby's like, why? It's not very satisfying. That bodybuilder is built for something more. Something that's a struggle. Something that should matter, right? However, in people's lives, you ever thought about the moment that people, for a moment, how they, they choose the wins they chase? People chase sports wins, right? Financial wins, social wins. So we won't try to swim for, for money, for power, prestige. We pass on from this realm, and our physical bodies are fertilizing some patch of daisies. How much those those wins can be worth? Nothing, right? It doesn't matter anything at that point. The Hall of Flame plaque, the huge bank account, the cabinet of trophies. It's like the arm wrestler, the big bodybuilder arm wrestling the baby, right? It doesn't matter. It's very hollow. They're hollow because they don't really matter if they're for ourselves. But flip that around. If they are for God, how much do they matter? If you're taking those what you do in your life and your accomplishments, and you're showing the glory of God, the love of God, you got a struggle that counts and matters. If you're directing those victories for God's glory, it's a big, whole different story, isn't it? We're built for something more than what we than just our mess and the baby, right? The hollow victory. We're built for something bigger. And we got to say, do we choose to be focused on, on ourselves in a short-sighted manner? Or do we see ourselves as God truly does, as his children? If Jonah had realized this, he wouldn't have ended up looking so ridiculous, would he? He wouldn't have tried to run from God, and he wouldn't have realized the victory right in front of him. He was right there. In our lives, we've got to stop our messing the babies. Every time we go for a victory, it doesn't mean anything in the end. Because we want it for selfish reasons, for ourselves. We might as well be arm wrestling something, something hollow. We've got to be looking for eternity, for that gate beyond, those things that last. Now, you got to keep playing hard, working hard, preparing hard. That's life. That's what God wants you to do. And you must be putting that, your hand, it even says in Ecclesiastes, put your hand, put your might to whatever you find in front of you, doesn't it? That's the way you're supposed to live. That's what God wants you to do. But don't be like Jonah. Don't forget whose party it really is. Who we really are. Now make like, whatever you put your hand to so much more meaningful. So much more satisfying than if you do it for yourself. If it's a win that counts for God, it's a victory that really counts. It's getting our souls back home to God. And so, whether you're winning all the time, or it feels like you haven't been winning for a while, try to reevaluate what you're chasing, and what you're looking for in that win. Sometimes you might find God doing like he did for Jonah, and just kind of tapping on the switch, like, are you going for the right direction? Is that where you're supposed to be headed? You know, God's face is, when God told Jonah, are you sure you should be angry? He's basically going, hey, crazy fella, look over here. Sometimes God will do that to us too. He's going to do it in some strange ways, but he does tell you, he does speak. If God was a human, he would have lost it with Jonah many times over, wouldn't he? When he ran away, when he got angry for the huge victory, God would have basically been like, yeah, crazy, crazy. Why would you do that? But, Look back in Jonah 4, verse 4, and what does God say? Jonah 4, verse 4. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? He's tapping Jonah on the shoulder. He's doing it gently. He's doing it softly. He's basically saying, Hey, buddy, calm down. Look at what's right in front of you. It's not right for us to keep arm wrestling babies, chasing the winds that don't matter in eternity, right? We need to check our perspective, gain a bit of perspective of God, see things of how he sees things, get our attitude adjusted the way he wants us to be. And that's the message for today. Very short, very simple. 
Have you found yourself chasing winds for the wrong reasons? Or have you been studying and decided you want to get baptized and go to the ultimate win, join God, go back home to Him? Now, anytime is a great time to be baptized. It's always good to make that decision. That is the ultimate goal. That is the ultimate win. When you put that in perspective with anything else we can gain here in this world, gain your soul, makes everything else look pitiful. That's the big victory. That's what we got to go for. But if you want to be baptized, or if you need the prayers of the congregation, please let it be known as we stand and we sing the invitation song. Thank you.